catastrophe we're seeing in, in South Australia, it's not only South Australia, but within your portfolio, your very interest is the flooding in the Riverland and the devastation that's occurring there. I, I, I heard this morning from someone on the radio that some, a lot of houses still don't have electricity. Yes. And that's been yeah. a few weeks now. It has, yeah. It's, it's a remarkable, uh, something I haven't seen in my lifetime. This is you know, perhaps the most significant flood event we've had for uh, at least 50 years. Um, and uh, what that's meant is a lot of properties, um, both uh, farming properties, but also uh, holiday shacks, but also people's uh, ongoing you know, permanent place of, of residence have been flooded, or if they haven't been directly flooded, then quite often the uh, electricity infrastructure that provides them with power has been threatened by the floods, and so power's been cut off. And of course, you know, once we're without power in our homes or within our businesses, it's impossible to be there. So there's been about 3,500 properties that are without power. We think that somewhere in the order of six or 700 of those are homes that people live in, and the remainder are mainly holiday homes and, and, and other properties which are not residential. Um, but with the floodwaters now having reached their peak through the major townships, they'll start to recede and then that really hard work begins of trying to restore people's power uh, and trying to rebuild the infrastructure that's been damaged by the floods. I can't remember the number, but the, the amount of water that was going through in a day is what Adelaide consumes in a year. That's right. Uh, and I, I, that doesn't blew my mind away. It's incredible. It's, uh, you know, the peak flows, I think, got to about 194 gigalitres, which is all of the water that we consume for our homes, our small businesses, for commercial and industrial use across the entire state in one year. And every day, and you think about this being an event which travels over several weeks, it's just an absolutely extraordinary amount of money, uh, it's extraordinary amount of, of water uh, that, um, that flows down the river. So the, the levels coming down, the I understand the state government has been providing already some help and there's more relief on the way for other businesses and families? Yes, that's right. So we, we knew that some people would have to leave their homes uh, and they would need some support to uh, find somewhere else to go and meet all of the costs associated with that, so there were some grants for that. We also knew that some businesses would have to close, either because they were going to be inundated by rising floodwaters, or just because it was going to be impossible for them to operate, they couldn't get stock into their businesses and so on. And so there were grants for people who wanted to close early. Um, but for those businesses that wanted to continue trading, we also provided some support for them if they had a downstream to trade. The federal government has then partnered with the state government to provide further rounds of support, particularly to help businesses and uh, agricultural uh, operations to rebuild after the floodwaters go. Um, it's important to remember that as the floodwaters move down the river, they're moving at some speed and uh, they scour the river and they scour the landscape and they cause damage um, to properties and to infrastructure as, uh, as they move past and that will all have to be rebuilt. So um, it's a very expensive exercise having to deal with a, a major flood event like this. Are, are we claiming this to be part of climate change? Is it just a freak event? Well, the River Murray has flooded many times over the time that um, the Europeans have settled uh, Australia and, and of course we assume many times before that. Um, but we do think the number of times that we're likely to have a flood event or a bushfire or some other major uh, change in our climate or, or weather that causes these impacts is likely to become more frequent um, because uh, our climate is, is changing. Um, you know, as the weather gets progressively warmer, um, then we have uh, either more heat waves or we have more moisture in the atmosphere and that causes you know, either conditions for bushfires or conditions for floods or conditions for cyclones or storms. This is something that we'll have to get used to and um, that's a very difficult task for us to try and accommodate because it costs a lot of money to 
um, develop infrastructure which is more resilient and um, finding insurance for people's homes and businesses is very difficult as well. On the infrastructure uh, side, um, what, what can we do? You, oh, I, I heard a few times that levies failed or was catastrophic. What, what? Yeah, so, so uh, since the 1956 and then the 1974 floods that we had, levies were built. These are effectively big earthen banks which are built either side of the river, higher than the properties either side of them, so that if the water does rise, it doesn't flood um, uh, uh, away from the river. And uh, they are built to a certain level and they have to be built out of certain material. Clay is most effective at withholding water. But of course, once clay fully dries out, it can crack and fracture and, and, and they need constant um, attention and, and maintenance. So the flood event is so high that even though these levees were built to a standard and maintained to a standard, they simply haven't been high enough. Um, but also there are some levees which haven't been maintained um, and uh, they've seen uh, water breach through. In the majority of cases, that's not to people's homes, it's to other types of properties. Um, but even if it's to a business, you know, for example, it could be a caravan park or um, it could be another small business that operates in the town centre. That's very damaging, not just for the business, but for the community that it's a part of. 